Thanks. I'd like to thank the panel. I'm really sorry we couldn't hear from Graham Smith. Uh, we seem to have had some. He seemed to have had some technical problems in getting onto this. Um, so um, it's a shame because uh, I would have valued his take on this. Um, so um, we're going to go now. Well, I, I had been going to do a break, but I, I, I think we better, for the sake of, um, uh, of timing um, and keeping to time, move on to the next session. Thank you all very much to uh, Linda, um, Megan, Julian and to Lucy as well um, for joining uh, in this session. Uh, hopefully you'll stay involved and will um, contribute in comments in the next session. So having uh, um, had prolonged overture, as it were, we're now moving into actually hearing about the ActDev uh, project um, from um, uh, Robin and uh, Joey Talbot um, and also from uh, Martin Lucas Smith from Cycle Street and uh, Dustin Carlino uh, from AB Street. You've heard them mentioned uh, previously. Um, so, um, well, I think we better ask uh, Robin and Joey to actually explain the tool to us. So th that's the, what you can see on your screens is the uh, program uh, coming up. So I think we're getting, we need 15 minutes of uh, Robin and Joey, and um, uh, 10 minutes from Martin, 10 minutes from Dustin, and then uh, we'll have a Q&A. Robin? Robin's on mute. Good. Okay. Thank you I can see loads of uh, stuff going on, so sorry about this. Okay, Blimey. so third time lucky. Uh, yeah, this is what we're going to talk about in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, and definitely in favour of having a little break because uh, it's a Friday afternoon. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about what the tool actually is from a kind of data perspective. And I think it is important to, rather than everyone diving into using the tool, just seeing how it's working in practice and where the, the various data layers are coming from. And then you're going to hear from Martin, who's going to be talking about some uh, plan the planning data that's feeding into it and also quite an exciting new layer related to low traffic neighborhoods. And then finally, from Dustin Carlino, we're going to hear about this new technology, really, that enables you to simulate traffic, including walking and cycling and how they may or may not interact with motor traffic. So um, there's going to be, again, we want to make this a participatory, participatory session. So, of course, there's going to be a Q&A session. And during that Q&A session, we're going to share a link to the tool. And then the most participatory part of this uh, workshop is breakout rooms, where you'll be able to have um, conversations and everyone will be able to turn on the audio and kind of discuss the, the, the wider issues. So I thought I'd just put this in context. In terms of the tool itself, it's a web application. Uh, we've designed it as a web application because that really minimizes the barrier to entry. It means that anyone with a web browser, who is most people nowadays, uh, can, can access the tool without needing to pay for a subscription, without needing to pay for specialist software, which I think is one of the issues um, in the evidence base, some of the tools do require some kind of uh, payment, either for software or a service. Um, we believe that the more people who have access to the data, the better decisions will be made. And uh, the first thing that you'll see when you go onto the, the um, link, and you can see the link there, but I would encourage you to wait until the Q&A session before actually having a look, um, is data on travel. It's about travel. and. The, the key metric that we are encouraging people to focus on is actually very simple. Given the complexity of the multiple layers of data going in, it is possible to be overwhelmed with data. And I think having discussed this in the team, we came up with a, a single fairly simple um, primary metric, which is simply the percentage of trips at a site made by active travel. And that gives you a single number 
that would could potentially form the basis of guidance. So you could say uh, new development sites must have at least 30% of trips um, being made by active travel, for example. And um, yeah, we, we've got 35 sites that we've used and we've got, I think, something that could scale up uh, to a national tool. So that's that was the uh, national overview. And in terms of the research that we've done, we took a, a fairly representative sample of large development sites um, that's based on a report for, for um, transport for new homes. And that gave us a big diversity of sites here. So you can see I've got one which is uh, near Cambridge, one uh, just south of Manchester, which is actually Handforth. And we found um, in terms of quantif quantification, we calculated uh, distances and routes to the nearest town centre, which is obviously a major trip attractor in many locations. And the median distance was uh, 3.2 kilometres, only two, only three of them, going back to Megan's point about walking has a very rapid distance decay, only three sites were within uh, two kilometres. One interesting finding is that if you take the travel behaviour, the travel patterns of the areas surrounding these 35 development sites, uh, you actually get the same percentage roughly um, of trips made by people who live there, according to the 2011 census, as is made nationwide. So that shows that you do have quite a diversity within there. So it ranges from very low levels to fairly high levels. Um, but the the biggest problem that we, we found, I think, is um, in terms of the route quality. So whilst in many cases there was uh, services within walkable and cyclable distances, often you had absolutely no provision for walking and cycling, certainly very limited um, cycling routes and often you would have to go on busy roads, which is illustrated in the uh, right hand plot, uh, the right hand map there. So um, the research is ongoing. We have a lot of data to work with on this project. So there's a um, mostly we've been focusing on building a tool, but we also have a large data set from the Planet API that gives us many thousands of development sites, which are just shown in this a national overview map here and analysis of that data is ongoing but essentially we'll be looking at the extent to which those uh, development sites are uh, walkable and, or, and cyclable compared with um, national averages and just to clarify what that plot shows you've got in blue are all development sites and the ones that are in yellow we've got data on the estimated number of dwellings. So you can see that they tend to cluster around London and existing uh, conurbations. So that's a little bit on where we would like to go in a research perspective. Uh, one other key point about this tool is that while it's good to look at existing provision and existing travel perhaps, patterns, I think it's also important to build a vision of what would be possible. So similar to the, the propensity cycle tool, which is very much driven by scenarios of what could happen to try and build the case for change, we use a simplistic model called Go Active, which um, models substantial uptake of both walking and cycling at the um, origin destination level. And I've just got a plot here that shows what that model looks like um, when you take national data. So you've got um, different modes represented by the colors and obviously driving tends to increase. And this uh, plot really makes the point that you can have the best walking and cycling provision in the world, but if all your trip distances are over five or 10 kilometers, it's gonna be very, very difficult to get people out of cars unless there is um, good public transport links in the area, which is one limitation of the tool is that we haven't analysed public transport uh, potential, partly due to the disruption around uh, the pandemic and um, 
public transport use being very low, but also because technically uh, that's a much harder thing to do. So I think at this point, I'm going to actually hand over to Joey, who has the benefit of having visited many of these sites in person, so can provide good insight into the relationship between what the tool's saying and what's actually on the ground, which is obviously critical. You have to know what it's like on the ground and not just provide data, although, of course, the data can really tell you a lot about the walking and cycling potential. And I've just, the final slide here before passing over to Joey shows, I think, a good, a good example of a site that this is actually doable. You can create um, development sites that have high walking and cycling potential. This is the Leeds Climate Innovation District. And you can see straight away, it's close to a major urban centre that you've got many existing trips are made by walking and cycling, or particularly walking in this case. So therefore, it's likely that the residents of this new development site will also make lots of walking trips. So the evidence is there. And we think that the tool gives you a very good overview and a good indication of the provision and the potential for walking and cycling um, at the site level. So Joey, I'm going to hand over to you, assuming that the technology works. I'm going to try and uh, stop screen sharing at this point. Hi, thanks very much, Robin. So yeah, I'm going to do a screen share myself and I'm going to show you how the tool actually works and go through it to look at a few different sites and try and tell a story of how you can use that to examine um, walking and cycling potential around a new housing development. So, right, I'm just going to have a look at this screen share and just make sure that this actually shares it. Brilliant. OK, so I hope you can all see um, I'm now on the um, main landing page of the tool. So this is what you see to start with. We've got a list of our case study sites and there's also some links to information. We've got a report and a manual and a feedback link um, to provide information about the tool and you, so you can give feedback. So I'm going to dive straight in to one of our case study sites. So I'll start off with Great Nathan in Cambridge. So in terms of uh, cycling, uh, sorry, this, hasn't, this has gone to a different one. I'll just swap that over. Um, so in terms of cycling, this is um, as good as it gets, pretty much. Um, you can see um, on the right, we have a map of the local area. You can see Cambridge there. Um, and on the left, we've got a set of information about the site, um, some key stats um, and some graphics. And so I'll just explain a bit about those. Um, so at the top here, um, there's links to a planning application for the site. Um, you can also dive straight into a simulation, which Dustin will talk to you about later. But here you have some key stats. So 47% active commuters, that's in green because that's that's pretty high. Um, and of those, you can see 31% cycling. And then we have this mode split graph. So this is based on existing conditions, which is the, the best data we've got is from the 2011 census. So that's for the area surrounding the site. Um, not all of these sites will have been in existence in 2011, but it's for the local area. And you can see for the area around Great Knighton in Cambridge, most of the commutes are actually fairly short distances, zero to three or three to six kilometers into Cambridge city center. And lots of those are walking or cycling. What we can do is we can go to our go active scenario. That's imagining what might happen if we've got really the strong investment um, in walking and cycling infrastructure, um, really good conditions. And you can see walking and cycling increases even more. So there's very little driving now. So I'll just go back to the current baseline scenario. 
and you can see there's various other um, layers here that we've got. Um, so you can have a look at some of these. We've got journey time statistics. They show average journey times. This one in particular um, showing average journey times to centers of employment. Um, and you can see essentially from this map um, in Cambridge City, um, the journey times are, as you expect, lower than they are in more rural areas. And um, we've got all kinds of things. So we've got um, this map of um, accessibility. So what this is showing is taking the route network, which I'll explain to you in a sec. Um, this is looking at the um, busyness of the roads in different areas, in clockboard type zones around the development and you can see there's lots of green on here which essentially shows that most of these routes are on quite quiet roads off-road perhaps or dedicated cycle lanes perhaps so um the other one that's tipped here is the route network so these are cycle routes from the site to cambridge town center or to air to commuter destinations so to workplaces um, so you can see there's lots of routes in towards the town centre or other parts of the town. And these are mostly blue, um, which shows that they're on quiet roads. The busyness is low, so it's perhaps off road or on dedicated cycle infrastructure. Um, if you want to go to a different type of site, um, we can have a look at Wynyard. So here you get an idea of the importance of location and site design. So have a look at this graph. Um, suddenly it looks very different to the previous um, development we were looking at. So there's lots of red, which is um, driving to work. Um, and in the stats, you can see 83% of people commuting as car drivers. If you switch to the go active scenario, it barely changes, still 79%, because basically the distances here are so long, it's um, there's, there's not very much you can do, essentially. Um, you can see these routes are pretty um, circuitous. And if you look down into the site itself, one, one of the other layers we've got here is the InSight network. So you can see what do the walking, cycling or driving networks look like within the site. You can see this is very, very wiggly. And there's also some gaps. Um, whereas if you switch to driving, those gaps are going to vanish. So basically within this site, running through the middle, we've got a major dual carriageway. I can switch the base map here to show you it more clearly. Um, so there's a major dual carriageway and currently at least according to OpenStreetMap, there's no way to get across that walking or cycling. So that's a major barrier. Um, we can also have a look at some other sites and just explain a bit more about how you can use this tool. So I'm going to head to Upton in Northampton. And here, so look on the left. Again, 83% um, driving in the baseline um, existing conditions in 2011. But um, there's more opportunity for change. So if you go to the go active scenario, what could happen if we had really positive conditions, um, if we had the best infrastructure? And now it's all the way up to 25% of people cycling to work. So have a think about, OK, how could, what, what's holding those people back? And how could we change this? So first of all, let's look at the site itself. Um, we're still on the InSight network, and that's very different to Wynyard. It's direct. There's a really comprehensible, legible street layout. It's easy to walk and cycle around the site. And another thing we've got down here is we've got some site photos. Um, and it actually looks pretty nice. So yeah, that looks great. Um, why are 83% of people driving to work currently? Um, well, if we start looking at the surrounding area, We've got some major roads surrounding the site um, with a, then a retail park on the other side. And it looks like that might be cutting off Upton from the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so I'm going to go to back to the default base map so it's a bit clearer and then show you the route network. So it, once we have once that loads, we'll be able to see routes to work 
um, from Upton to um, destinations. And you can see here we've got all lots of routes heading around to different parts of Northampton, mostly. And obviously, we've got Northampton Town Centre here. That's going to be an important destination. So let's start thinking about how would people get there? So first of all, what you've got to do is you've got to cross this major ring road. There's a couple of roundabouts here. This roundabout, it looks like there are ways across. This one is heading from what's called the High Street. Is there any way across that one? So I just went into a quick um, Google Street view. That's the High Street in Upton Development. Looks lovely. Um, straight away, you head into this major roundabout and essentially there's it's, it's impossible to walk or cycle across there. There's no chance. So, okay, but you can go across the other one. Um, so then we've got some routes heading into Northampton. These ones, you've got that road across the industrial estate. And then over here, they turn red. That shows the roads are quite busy. So that the busyness of these main roads into the town may be putting people off. But over here, there's a route along the River Nate. The River Neen navigation could be nice. So I just had a quick look at that again on Google Street View. OK, you can understand perhaps why not that many people use this, although there is a cyclist in the picture. You can also see what you might want to do if you want to improve walking and cycling access to this area. So finally, just very quickly, um, I'm going to show that we also include sites that haven't been built yet. So here's one that hasn't actually been built yet. Somewhere that may be familiar to you, some of you, Handforth Garden Village, uh, after yeah, an area that's been in the news recently. Um, and here it's on the edge of Manchester. You can see there's quite a lot of people driving to work um, currently. Um, and these routes are quite circuitous. There's quite a lot of red on the map showing busy roads. That could change, though, because it hasn't actually been built yet. So there's the potential to add in new walking and cycling links um, to improve access to the site. But have a look on the satellite just to get a clearer picture of what it looks like. And you can see something familiar. There's two very large um, roads, dual carriageways, around um, the edge of this site. So there's quite a lot of work that would need doing to make that into a good place for walking and cycling. So now I will pass over to Martin to tell you some more about the detail of um, what um, planning and routing data we are using. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Hopefully, Hello, you can see me. Great. Uh, and is my sheet screen sharing okay? No, it's not yet, so I'll just switch that on. There we are. Uh, is that now showing? Not yet. I think uh, I've still got it crossed out. Is that... Um... Ah, I am pressing share, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Let's try this one instead. Mark, do you need to enable me to do this? I'm, I'm still getting it crossed out for some reason. No, it should be working perfectly for you, Martin. All right, well, it's not allowing me. Um, I wonder if we could go to the next, do we have a next speaker and then come back to me if I can't uh, get this to work easily? Um, uh, okay, can we go to Dustin who can, Take us through some other bits. There's a lot of questions about this going in the chat box, by the way, um, which if um, Robin and Joey uh, and others can respond to, that would be great. Um, Dustin, do you want to take us through what you're up to? Um, um, yes, let's see if, uh, is my screen visible? Um, ah, that, that's, um, that looks like the same as uh, Robin and Joey were showing. Is oh, great, okay. Uh, just making sure it's working. So. Um, Hi, I'm Dustin, uh, and I'm going to present to you um, work called AB Street that uh, it's been integrated into this project. So from the main ActDev page, um, from any site, you can click on View Simulation. <coughs> um, and this brings us into a new tool called AB Street. So uh, right away, I'm just going to pause and um, add in some background traffic to make this a little bit more interesting. 
So this is a, uh, a traffic simulation that runs um, either in your web browser or you can download it and run it locally. Um, and this is uh, simulating individual trips around uh, the Poundbury site in Dorchester. So uh, right, right here, we're looking at sort of the um, zoomed out view of, of the site. We have Poundbury uh, to the left and Dorchester to the right. And um, assuming the screen isn't too small, you should be able to see uh, some dots moving around the screen. Um, so to mention, this, uh, the, the map data for this comes from OpenStreetMap, and the traffic data comes from the 2011 census. And this tool, um, if both of these sources are available, uh, can be run anywhere uh, in the world. So um, slowing down the, the simulation and zooming in on one particular area, uh, the, the zoomed in view of AB Street, now you can see um, we have individual lanes of traffic. Um, we have an intersection controlled by a traffic signal. Uh, where we're inferring the, the timing and the stages. Um, and you can see individual agents being simulated. These are cars queuing at an intersection, and uh, they're really small, but you have some pedestrians walking across the, the sidewalk here. Um, so AB Street attempts to uh, simulate this high level of detail and, let you, and lets you uh, do a fair bit with it. So for example, we can click on a particular agent and see, uh, see what they're doing. So this is an agent-based model um, modeling individual people. And again, the data is coming from the 2011 census to figure out uh, where they live and work. And so this particular trip started somewhere off map to the north, and it looks like they're going into um, this car park just south of Dorchester. Uh, so with this view of following an individual agent, we can see think we can see stats like how long they've spent on their trip, um, how much of the time that they spent waiting, and, and so on. Um, we also have, uh, besides the individual view, we have an aggregate view. So if you zoom back out and use the cycling activity tool in the corner, this is, uh, and I'll speed up time to kind of fill out this data a little bit faster, but um, this heat map is showing where lots of people uh, are using, or lots of cyclists are traveling and um, kind of classifying the road based on the infrastructure around. So you see all of these red maps being filled, or red roads being filled out. Um, that's where there's a lot of cycle traffic mixing with car traffic. Um, and over in the corner, you see a few uh, protected um, cycle paths and, and footpaths near the, um, looks like it's called uh, Cornhill and Antelope Walk, uh, kind of in the, the town center of Dorchester, um, where there's a lot of cycle traffic, but it is separated from road, road traffic. Um, so from this view, you might uh, notice a few patterns if we close it out. Um, and just by kind of watching the, uh, the dots move back and forth, um, Poundbury is an interesting site because uh, you're basically to go from uh, Poundbury into the, the town center, you see that all of the traffic is funneled on these two roads um, and there's, there's not much choice. So if we slow down time uh, and zoom in, you'll see some, uh, some patterns such as uh, we have a lot of, of vehicles stacking up um, and, and waiting. And the problem is uh, at the front, we have some, some poor cyclist who's probably kind of terrified for their life with all of this, uh, this traffic stacking up behind them. Um, Bridport Road is one lane each direction. And so in reality, it's, it's uh, highly likely that these cars would all be overtaking the cyclist um, if there's room, which is sort of uh, unsafe and unpleasant for, for both groups, or the cyclist would be forced to, to sort of share the, the sidewalk um, with these pedestrians or you know they they just might not they might not uh, cycle at all and so um, this is a, sort of a problem with the a potential problem with cycling uptake here so let's see how we might be able to fix it on the ground um, so over in the corner we have a button called edit map if we click it the uh, the traffic simulation disappears and we get a view where we can um, make some modifications to the map so zooming back in um, you can modify uh, individual roads and intersections. Like here, for example, if um, you had some clever idea for improving the timing at a traffic light uh, or for, for getting rid of an unprotected turn, you could you can modify things at the intersection. Um, and you can also modify things at the road level. So in this case, uh, my idea to kind of um, mitigate this issue is uh, to take these two roads, Bridport Road and Damers, that are sort of the, the bottlenecks between the two sites and um, make them one way each direction and use one of the lanes of space for cycle, for cycle traffic. So if I click on this lane, I can modify the type of it. Um, if we had a lot of transit here getting stuck in traffic, we could make it a, a, a bus lane or we could turn it into street parking or something like that. But in this case, I'm going to make it into a, uh, a bike lane and I'm going to uh, take the other side and just flip the direction so that um, the uh, Bridport Road points into Dorchester and then make the opposite change on the other side. 
so that you can use Damers to go from Dorchester back to um, back to uh, to Poundbury. So um, I, I want to make this change uh, kind of along the entire road, and just um, for the sake of time, I'm going to load uh, a file where I've done that previously. Um, so this uh, this edit to the map is um, the roads edited are in blue. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the idea is to take Bridport and make it one way into Dorchester, and then take uh, the opposite road and make it one way into Damers. So if we click on Finish and Resume, we will apply these map edits, um, and the simulation will reset from midnight. Uh, everybody's taking the same trips, but now um, we have this different infrastructure in place. Um, and already, you can see that uh, there's less traffic stacking up, and that's because now um, everybody has uh, sort of their own lane. So um, vehicles are able to, fro to, to flow freely, uh, and we still have um, cycle traffic that's able to use the, uh, the protected infrastructure. Just waiting a moment for, yeah, there we go. We can see, uh, now we can see the, um, the separation of traffic. Um, everybody's probably a lot happier. Uh, so you might have a lot of questions about the effect this, this sort of proposed change has on um, overall traffic patterns. So one thing we can do is use the uh, layers feature in the corner. Um, there's a lot of options here, but we're going to take a look at throughput. Uh, the throughput layer is similar to what we were looking at before, just showing us where a lot of people are traveling. But since this is a simulation, um, we can compare this to the to a baseline um, where uh, so in the baseline there were no changes to the map, and now we've we've made these one way roads. And so um, if we simulate a little bit further. Uh, we should see that more people are um, starting to take this north-south detour route. So uh, that's because we made things one way. Um, now some of the traffic is uh, wants to switch directions, and so it's going to use um, a couple of these like north-south roads to to change uh, to change the other side. And so um, this is just a way of kind of examining possible unintended consequence uh, unintended consequences of your changes, just to get an idea of what people might do um, to detour. So. Uh, another thing that you might wonder is um, how how does this impact uh, travel times? A lot of times, concerns about building new infrastructure, people will complain that it'll you know make the commute that they're used to uh, very long. So um, in the corner, we have a button called More Data. This brings us to um, a table that we'll look at in a minute. But uh, first, we're going to get an overall summary. Um, and so uh, this is basically comparing each trip that people are taking before and after our change to the to the one-way roads. And so since we see um, generally more green than red, that's good. Uh, it looks like trips between 0 and 15 minutes got a little bit faster um, in aggregate. Some of them got a little bit slower, but not too much. Um, and this is just a more detailed view showing uh, exactly like how many people in different um, ranges of, of trip times, like what was the relative uh, difference. But the point is, this doesn't. This actually seems to help everybody, which kind of makes sense, um, because now cars aren't queuing uh, behind cyclists. Um, but what if you want to get the, uh, the individual view? You can go back to the trip table. Um, and this is just breaking things down for all uh, approximately um, 5,000 trips that have completed so far, and eventually uh, about 20,000 that will complete later. So I want to find the trip that has been impacted the most to get a sense of um, if anybody is really going to be affected by this change. So if I sort by uh, like the normalized comparison, um, I see a trip that was uh, became four minutes, but originally used to be about, used to be about a minute. Um, if I click on it, you can sort of get a sense of what happened. Uh, they were traveling from the left to the right uh, by car. And originally, they were able to um, to take Bridport Road and go uh, uh, westbound. But since we made it one way, now they have to take this little detour around. And so it added um, a couple minutes to their trip. Uh, and so you know, in this case, I think that's OK. Like Looking at how close these um, these two sites are together, like it's uh, probably a case where they, they could have just walked in the first place. Um, so right, just uh, sort of summing up what um, AB Street lets you do. So uh, anywhere in the world, either in the um, web browser or running on your computer, you can run a traffic simulation um, using data from OpenStreetMap and trip data from, from various sources. And uh, you can make changes to, to the infrastructure on the ground and try to, um, try to improve things. And so this is uh, a way you can, um, if, if you have concerns about uh, residents resisting some proposal towards active travel, you can use this as a very visual and, and engaging way to, to demonstrate your plan um, and hopefully set people's mind at ease and, and deliver the, the vision that you uh, you want to build. And then um, much more than that, it's hopefully a way to 
uh, engage the public in some pub or engage the public in feedback and um, crowdsource a bit, asking uh, asking people themselves to to design the the changes that they want to see. So, for example, um, people are kind of uh, local experts on uh, on the rat run issues in their area, and so you could you could use this tool and ask people to dr to draw their ideal low traffic uh, neighborhood and sort of submit it as a proposal to uh, to your council to um, to consider. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Let's see. Um, there's a lot of questions in the chat box about this. Um, and a really important one, which somebody needs to address is, um, is this steady state or does it take into account that you might have more cyclists because it's safer? Um, so we'll come to that. But um, I, I imagine, given the background of all the people involved in this, you're assuming some more cycling, but because uh, that's what the Go Active thing does. Um, but Martin, do you want to see whether we can now go to your thing? Uh, <clears throat> yes, let me. There's something on the screen, so that's quite that. good. I can see something on the screen. Great. Let me just see if I'm getting a bit of feedback here, so. But hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, let me just see if I can switch to this screen, which I seem to have lost again. Sorry about this. I don't know why it's been so, so weird. Uh, Stephen, can I just check what you can see on the screen? A thing saying planning data and routing, a slide. Martin, I'm on screen sharing. Okay, I'm unable to actually change that. That's the problem. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, oh, I don't know why it's been so problematic. Yeah. Uh, it isn't possible for anybody else to. Oh, Mark, do you do you, have you received the Mark? Do you sent? do you, have you received the what I've sent? There's two of you now. Mark has got. Can I just check if Mark oh. has got? Oh, right. Well, something's there. Sorry, I can't actually switch to it for some reason. Um, Mark, can I just see if you've um, got my uh, if you received the Martin? I'm screen sharing your presentation right now. Perhaps you could, uh, perhaps you could uh, do it for me if I can't get this to. I think I, I think it would be best actually, Martin, if you plow on and let Mark do the. Um... Yes, exactly, Mark. Could you? Um, okay, so. Okay, next slide. Uh, yes. Then. Uh, hello. Great. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm Martin Lucas Smith. Sorry about the uh, problem there. Um, so, I'm one of the developers of Cycle Streets, um, which uh, so we're best known for our routing. Uh, so, if uh, apps and so on. Um, next slide, please, if you could. Next slide, Mark. Yeah. Um, so, if you've heard of an app called, for example, City Mapper, um, our routing is used um, in, in in that app um, and various other apps. Um, and uh, our routing is also used in the Propensity to Cycle tool uh, website, which uh, Robin uh, has mentioned. Obviously, a lot of people have no doubt heard of. Next slide, please. So, um, we've been involved in, I suppose, four parts of this project. Um, the first is uh, working with Planet, um, who, an organization who's doing uh, creating planning application data. Um, secondly, uh, we've been uh, providing cycle routing, so showing where the, the routes, routes go. Uh, thirdly, doing a new analysis of local transport, uh, sorry, um, local um, uh, low traffic neighborhoods. Um, and fourthly, we've been creating the web tool. Next slide, please. Um, so the first thing is that uh, planning application data. So um, the, uh, we've been working with um, Andrew Speakman from uh, Planet, and what he's been doing is creating a new national database um, of planning applications across the whole of the UK, well, uh, covering 98% of the UK, in fact. Um, uh, and this essentially is a major new um, data source um, on, on planning. Uh, in about over half of the cases, um, this includes the size and the type of development. So even though the planning authority might not actually publish um, what uh, what size or, or type of development is, we've actually been able to work this out based on, um, uh, if you like, clues in the in the the planning data in the planning information, such as, for example, the number of documents. Um, this data source is updated daily, so it goes to every local authority's website each day, um, and it's available through a, a data interface, which enables um, third parties 
um, and researchers and others uh, to analyze the data. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what we're seeing here is a typical um, screen that uh, you get uh, with, with planning data, uh, with, with planning information. And it's generally speaking, not particularly user-friendly um, website uh, available in each local authority. Um, next slide. And what we've been doing with Planet uh, is to turn that information, which is published only as web pages, um, into actual data. Um, and that's being done by basically going to each website, um, analyzing the, the, the web page, if you like, um, and turning it into a set of fields, and then combining all of every local authority, the 433 planning authorities, into a single database, which can be accessed consistently um, via uh, a data interface. Next slide, please. And what Andrew's also been doing is then to add in these additional fields, so size, type, and uh, whether it relates to another, or whether a particular planning application relates to another planning application. So for example, you might have a, a main planning application, which then has uh, some um, uh, conditions and others. Um, and you can see here on the screen, we've got these additional fields, size, type, and what it joins to. Next slide, please. Uh, and so what we're able then to do is to plot these on a map um, and use this data in very interesting and flexible ways. And so you can see at the bottom of the screen there, um, the, the, so this is an extract from the active tool and we clicked on the planning application button shown in orange and as a result it comes up with the planning applications in the area and what we've done is to filter these for the large applications so you can see here on the screen we have uh, for example a reserved matters application this is from the uh, from the uh, Trumpington website uh, Trumpington application and uh, you can see there it, it then gives a link to the planning application and that means that we then have very easy access to the particular documents um, that relates to this plan application. And we can see a bit more of the history of how uh, this site has been developed. Next slide, please. And there are lots of different ways in which we can use this, this data. Um, it's essentially a new national resource. What, one thing that we've been working on um, uh, is the idea that we could match ideas that the public have. So on the top left, we have a website where people have put ideas. Some local authorities might have sites like Commonplace and so on. And the idea is that we could um, match these with large planning applications. So if you look on the bottom left screen, you can see here we're looking at all the planning applications in, for example, the area that I live, but just filtered to large and medium sized applications. And so there's potential, now we have this new data source planning applications, we could actually match these ideas with new planning applications when they arise, so that, for example, those ideas could be funded through Section 106 um, agreements. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, such a piece of planning game. This is uh, the Cycle Park um, at Cambridge Station. Uh, I don't normally wear a uh, hard hat and an um, orange uh, vest, but this is actually uh, on the day it opened. Um, and this, this was basically achieved through a Section 106 obligation. And now that the planning data has been, if you like, liberated and turned into a database that, that can be used flexibly, there are lots of opportunities to, to do this kind of automated spotting of, of cases where ideas could be, could be funded by the developer. Next slide, please. Um, so that's a little bit about the planning data and the way that we're feeding it into the active tool um, and, uh, and so on. So the next thing is just to say a little about the cycle routing. So Robin showed you the busyness of the roads uh, emanating from the development. Um, and this uh, is achieved by um, the uh, looking at uh, really analysing a lot of things about the way the, street, the streets are set up. And um, this is actually our core work in cycle streets. We're best known for our journey planner. Um, we have a choice of route types, a sort of quiet route, perhaps for people who are not particularly confident, faster routes and a, a balanced route, which is a sort of a compromise between the quiet route and, and a fast route. And critically, what we're doing in the journey planet is we're not purely looking at distance. We're actually considering the cycle friendliness, the cyclability of the route. Um, Meg Megan talked about uh, this in her application, where although a developer may consider the, the ability to walk uh, to an, uh, to part from a development to outside, in a, in a similar way to that, it, it's often the case that a, uh, a developer will say, well, you know, you can, you can travel to all these distances. They'll show a sort of spider map, if you like, of places that you can get to uh, within 15 minutes by bike. But, off, but usually those don't really take into account the fact that, well, if there's a very busy road, no one's actually going to do that. Uh, and in, in Cambridge, we, had a, we have recently had a, a site which is basically surrounded by, by a six-lane, uh, pretty much motorway. 
and the developer claims it's going to be 40% levels of cycling, seven place. Uh, and actually, if you, you really do a proper cycle analysis to say, well, what's the cycle friendliness as well, you actually find that the, the amount of cycling is much less. So, so our, our routing is really considering, you know, what would a real cyclist do? How easy, is it, how, how nice is it, to, if you like, to cycle on a, in a particular area? And so this is concept with busyness, how busy is the road? And so we've been able to use that in the active site for accessibility analysis. Next slide, please. And our routing takes into account a whole range of things. Um, I've listed them here. So obviously street type, hills, presence of cycle infrastructure. How wide is that cycle infrastructure? So for example, a very narrow cycle lane, we actually give a negative score rather than a positive score, unlike uh, say Google, for example. Barriers and obstructions, land ownership, surface quality, uh, whether it's part of a national or, or local signed route is the lighting, uh, turn delay, so looking at junctions. And a new thing that we're, we're, we're shortly going to be added is uh, low traffic neighborhoods or ratlands. And um, perhaps we go to the next slide, please. So this brings on, me on to the, the third part of the, the, uh, the, the work that we've been doing, which is low traffic neighborhoods. Now we all know these are sort of heavily in the news, um, but next slide, please. The, these, are not, um, these are not new, they're not a new concept. Um, so I live in central Cambridge um, and uh, I'm actually in a low traffic neighborhood that was designed in the 1980s. Uh, and essentially what a low traffic neighborhood comes down to is, is, is one of three things. Firstly, is it, is it either a no through route you know, as can, can be, you know, a, a driver stops from driving through it, or is it basically, it, it, does the street have, is, is it part of a rat run? Can, can you drive from one main road to another? And I suppose there's then a third sort of subcategory between the two, which is a rat run, but with traffic calming. So the local authority has, uh, knows that there's a rat run, but uh, they've made some attempt to mitigate that. And what we've done is within all of the sites in the ACTZ uh, project, all 35 sites, we've performed an analysis um, to see which of the three categories each, each street goes into. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So this shows um, the area around Trumpington Meadows, which is one uh, I think Joey showed earlier. And uh, it shows in, in green the roads that are basically not uh, through routes. And there are then a small number in red. Um, which, so you can see within the sort of blue area, there's, there's one line which, which to see, and that essentially is a potential rat run. But in general, the site is, just doesn't actually, it is, is basically not, uh, it's a set of dead ends for driving. So you can, you can drive in and out, but you can cycle much more freely. Next slide, please. And we've performed this same analysis, not just in the, within the site, but actually in the area around the site. Uh, and indeed, uh, in most cases, that's, that's a large area of the city. So this is a central Cambridge, this is an area in Cambridge. Uh, again, it's where I live. Um, and it shows that actually the vast majority of streets that exist in the city are indeed low traffic neighborhoods already. So whereas we, you know, we, we, we see a lot of sort of social media and, and media coverage about low traffic neighborhoods, um, you know, banning people and so on. The, the fact is that on the ground, actually, a very large numbers of streets are already and have been for a long time low traffic neighborhoods. And so in this particular screenshot, uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation shortly, um, you can see that uh, the vast majority are green, um, but there are a few in red and even fewer where the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the, the rat run basically has had some mitigation done. So, so traffic calming in, in orange. Um, we'll be doing some work to improve the, the legibility because this is all very prototyping. Um, but yeah, you can see most are indeed uh, low traffic neighborhoods already. If we go to the next slide, please. Next slide. And so here is uh, Poundbury, which is one of the sites. This is actually the site that Dustin just showed us. Um, you can see here that, again, there are quite a lot of low traffic neighborhoods, but there are quite a few that aren't. And indeed, within the site, there is actually, um, the, it is possible to get through the site by car um, quite easily. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And interestingly, so what we've then done is to, to ha having plotted all, all these areas, um, we've then performed an analysis to actually get the total numbers. And again, within these are the whole cities, not just the sites, but the, the cities around them. And in the, the 35 areas we looked at, there are basically 86.9% 80, are not rat runs. Uh, rat runs exist only in 12.8% of streets and a very small number have are, are with traffic calming. I would just caveat that the traffic calming data in OpenStreetMap, which we've used, uh, does need a little bit of improvement. But what this shows is the vast majority of streets that we are already essentially low traffic neighborhoods. And I think that's, that's quite a, an interesting finding. Um, and we've, we've basically made this available within the site, uh, within the, the tool, 
Um, had I, uh, it's uh, one of the buttons at the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. And just to say that we are able to, if you wish to, we could generate um, further um, such analyses in your local authority area um, if wanted. So do get in contact with us. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Um, I will be running one of the workshop sessions um, later, so I'd be very happy to talk further about any of these. Um, but I hope that you found this, this new data on planning applications and low traffic neighbourhoods all beautifully integrated within the tool just by clicking a button um, useful. Thank um, you. Thanks ever so much, um, uh, Martin. And um, uh, a shame we had uh, so many uh, tech problems getting you your online. Look, we've got, a, 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 a unsus unsurprisingly, We've got a huge range of people um, uh, with uh, gagging, as Roger Geffen just said, to use the tool now. Um, it, he has said you need to remind people this is a development project. Um, so um, we're, uh, there's a running before you can walk thing. Um, uh, uh, Robin, did you, uh, I mean, what I'm going to do is to ask various people to comment on some of the things that have been raised. Um, uh, wh where this project goes now, um, scaling up. Um, uh, uh, Robin, do you want to comment on some of the things that have been said? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, yeah, we, we were expecting there to be um, uh, questions about where, where we go next. It's, it's great to hear the, the feedback that this is the kind of thing that, that could be useful. And yeah, I mean, new technology and new data cannot solve 100% of the, the issues that we've been talking about. Obviously, it's largely a political issue however i'm very confident that good data and good models um can help with that especially if they if that data gives you a clear pathway to um creating positive interventions and citing uh, new developments in places that will lead to in, improved quality of life and walking and cycling so absolutely we would love to take this further um i'm open-minded about how best to do this um, and it's worth just reiterating that this has been done as part of an academic uh, four month project so I think given what we've done in four months I think it's pretty clear that we could do this on a national scale all of the uh, data sets that we've been using are available um, nationwide including for Scotland although the origin destination data requires slightly more um, data pre-processing, but the, the data absolutely is there. So that's the, the first thing that I'd say. I mean, we we are open-minded about how best uh, to take this forward. And uh, some of these conversations can happen afterwards. And I, I hope to be presenting this uh, tool to um, people in the Department for Transport and MHCLG um, after the workshop incorporating some of the valuable feedback so the other thing to say is any feedback that you have please do uh, add it to the questionnaire you'll find a, a questionnaire link on the active website so um, during this Q&A session it's a great opportunity for you to ask us questions and us to provide feedback but if you don't have any questions that you want to ask over the audio please do go away and check out well don't go away stay on stay on the line but um, while this is going on check out um actdev the, the actdev website and have a play and yeah that that's the first thing that i wanted to say about the, the importance of this feedback because that will allow us to build the case for changing the tool and taking it forward hopefully in, a, in an improved state nationwide thank you um who'd like to comment uh, possibly martin on this the um or dustin the one that uh, various people have said, which is the feedback between having better walk cycle infrastructure and more people walking and cycling. And that probably changes the um, winners losers calculation that Dustin showed us, I suspect. Because if you assume that a lot of people faced with a longer drive, then transfer to walk cycle, um, then they become winners in this. Oh, have I got that wrong? I mean, there's the several people have made that comment, uh, Roger Geffen particularly. Um, uh, Dustin, do you want to comment on that? Sure. So um, the scheme that I showed in Poundbury uh, is a little bit contrived, probably um, just to mention you, you wouldn't make this kind of one-way scheme like that. Um, and of course, if you do uh, improve time, or if you if you do take, like as you take cars off the road, it becomes faster to drive um, 
for the ones that continue that like wish to remain uh, wish to remain driving. Um, but I, I think it's probably still kind of a like a net win if you can convert people towards cycling and then gradually like take back more road space for cycling. Um, in terms of uh, the modeling, right now the simulation doesn't. Um, it only kind of like shows short term effects, and so uh, the people still choose to to have the same commute patterns and use the same mode. Um, but adding in a mode uh, a mode shift calculation is one of the things that I'm hoping to do uh, in the next quarter. Great, uh, Martin. Did you want to comment? No. Yeah? Okay. Um, any other comments? Um, mm -hmm that people have seen. Robin, anything you've seen in the chat box? That Yeah, uh... yeah, just about data. So I think a um, question from Emma was about, um, could we incorporate demand from other tools? And the answer is, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, we've always been thinking about uh, scaling this up nationally, however. So when, when we're making the decision of whether or not to include a new data set, because of the importance of um, being able to create a tool that is standardized across a large area, hopefully including Scotland uh, and Wales. Um, we would like to use data sets that are available nationwide. And there are various uh, kind of regional uh, transport models that provide this origin destination data more up to date than 2011. However, there isn't, to my knowledge, any up to date uh, nationally available projections up to uh, 2030, for example. I know the Department for Transport has commissioned the National Trip Ends model, and we would be able to consume origin destination data that's simulating future change. Um, but I think that the most likely way that we could address this issue going forward, and this goes back to Megan's point about the importance of dense walking networks to local um, areas such as shops and all of all of the kind of local stuff would be to simulate it that's doable using data from OpenStreetMap on where parks are where schools are uh, where pubs are so the, the, this is doable but that's a fairly substantial piece of academic research that needs to be done it's definitely doable and certainly given what we've done in um, four months which includes uh, simulation of trips to the nearest town, although in a fairly kind of rudimentary way. But I think that would be the, the way forward, just to identify where those trip attractors are and then simulate routes uh, to those destinations. So that's one thing that I wanted to say about the data and the importance of being able to scale this up nationally. Right. Um, I, I'm really sorry. Um, I was hoping to try and bring in Graham Smith, but we've kind of, for various reasons, got to the point where I think we need a break because we absolutely, Graham, did you want to say anything uh, before you just reappeared? Can, is there anything you'd like to say um, yes. to comment on this? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. The, well, I put a couple of questions in, in, the, in the chat. One of the, things that, one of the things that I think we brushed over to some extent, I can hear somebody typing, yeah. um, is, uh, is fear, of, fear of busy. And yeah. um, from an urban design point of view, what we have to find for existing streets and for new developments is, um, is, is to find a way of making the busy desirable, to make the busy into a place. This is one of the things that was implicitly in Manual for Streets. But of course, many politicians, most people, most engineers hate the idea of places being streets or streets being places. And this is a huge uh, lacuna in 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 our debate i mean what question robin just a moment ago was talking about local access to local shops traditionally shops only exist on the best connected streets shops don't exist at the end of a cul-de-sac shops exist where most customers can find them now this might be a model that's quaintly old-fashioned and no longer fits with um uh, the digital uh, digital age but uh, if i'm working at my digital computer i might still want to go for a coffee when I'm allowed out, and that coffee shop is likely to be on the busiest connected street. Do you see the point I'm making? Um, the fear of business. Uh, who'd like to? Yeah, talk I can um, tell, uh, talk a bit about that. So um, the kind of busyness that we've used, um, it's not purely about the amount of traffic. 
it's a kind of it's more of a cyclability rating um which encompasses a wide range of factors so including um things like skills um and the quality of um like the quality of psychopaths where they exist um and but essentially it's looking at um if you consider all various factors including the amount of traffic that people would need to be alongside but um other things as well what what looks like a good quality route but again this is the sort of thing we want feedback on so if if this should be kind of adjusted to um so another thing we so, so there are other factors that we should look at um then brilliant um and martin will also be able to talk a bit about this because he has been key on um developing these cyclability ratings but again the the yeah we we want um well connected places obviously i, I we're going to have to stop it there unfortunately